And today um, uh, we are really happy um, to have Katra Frila and Matthias Menger with us. And so we will have a special lecture with two speakers. Katja um, is the head of research department three at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And she has been leading, I'd say, uh, the impact uh, model intercomparison project EasyMap since its beginning. And she recently also has been a lead author to chapter 16 of the uh, sixth assessment report of the IPCC of working group two. And so there she focused really on climate impact attribution and made a really big step in summar summarizing our knowledge on climate impact attribution. So we will hear a lot about this, I think, in her talk. So great, Katja, that you are with us today. And then we also have Matthias Mengel with us. He is a deputy head of the same research department at PIC. And um, he has originally worked on sea level rise and Antarctic ice sheet dynamics, but now since um, some time he has been in the climate impact world and he's also involved in EasyMap. And he has been responsible for um, developing this method for climate impact attribution that is now used in EasyMap. So I think we will all get to know this method now today. And so um, very warm welcome also to Matthias today. And yeah, we are really looking forward to your talk. So the floor is yours. And I said, as I said, please put your questions so far in the Q&A tool. And then at the very end, we can discuss. We are very looking forward to your talk. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. So, um, yeah, I would I would like to start the presentation on climate impact attribution with a um, broader somehow perspective on on attribution in general, because in actually it's a topic in all three working groups of the IPCC, and there is a cross sect a cross working group uh, box um, which appears, for example, in chapter one of the working group two contribution to the AR six. Um, but it's really, it in, includes a general definition where um, detection is uh, defined as the demonstration that a considered system has changed without providing reasons for the change. And attribution is defined as the identification of the causes of the of, of, of observed long-term changes in an indicator or of the change in the temporal or spatial extent or the intensity or frequency of a specific event. And uh, from working group to working group, uh, this, this is uh, the basic definition, but the considered uh, independent and dependent systems somehow differ. And um, for impact attribution, the dependent system is, uh, is the, are the human and natural systems, and the drivers are the changes in, um, in climate-related uh, systems. And an observed impact is defined as the difference between the observed state of a natural human or managed system and a counterfactual baseline that is correct that characterizes the system states in the absence of changes in the climate related system. And climate related systems are the climate system itself and most of, of um, my talk will be will, will, will be really be on attribution to changes in the climate system, but it also includes um, changes in in yeah the ocean the cryosphere and as physical and chemical systems so other potential drivers um, of the changes in working group one are for, for example sea level rise increasing atmospheric uh, co2 concentration and ocean ocean acid acidification so to put it a little bit in perspective to um, the impact attribution, so what is impact attribution, what is, what is climate attribution and what is impact attribution, the classical um, detection and attribution framework is probably uh, established in working group one where the main question is, um, are ob observed changes in the climate system caused by changes in greenhouse gas emissions or is it mainly an internal variation in the climate systems that causes the change? This is the, I would say, the main working group one question. But uh, for working group two, as I said, we consider actually the, the systems that depend on the, on the climate system 
um, the biophysical and social impacts. So for example, changes in biodiversity, wildfires, but also changes in um, so, uh, societal processes as migration, economic development, um, whatever. <laughs> and uh, our main question is, um, are these changes in these systems actually caused by climate change or are they mainly driven by, are they um, driven by direct human influences? Um, and this is um, then the main question for, for working group one and what is important is that then we do not necessarily um, attribute the changes in the in, in the human and natural systems to the emissions of climate change, but really to, uh, to of greenhouse gases, but really to climate change. And we do not necessarily ask where this climate change comes from. So it's really the observed change in the climate related system, no matter where it comes from. Where, of course, because you could also ask the question whether an observed change in the natural or human system is caused by greenhouse gas emissions, but that's not necessary um, um, if you uh, for for impact attribution. It's just important to to highlight what what kind of driver you actually consider, whether it's uh, greenhouse gas emissions or the changes in in the climate system, no matter where it comes from. And so, ideally, if, uh, so. Um, the definition says, well, you should um, compare the observed state of the system, the natural or human system, to a counterfactual state um, without climate change. So let's assume we have an Im impact indicator. Let's say it's uh, damages induced by flood events, for example, and that's indicated here by the black line, the observation line. Then, and then this change can actually be driven by changes in the hazard. So really climate, uh, more and more heavy precipitation, for example, climate changes, but the damages could also be driven, for example, by changes in ex exposure or vulnerability. And to, to um, um, construct this counterfactual baseline, which cannot be observed, ideally we would use um, models and impact models, process-based impact models as are a good tool to actually do this. It would mean that, that um, ideally we would have an impact model that forced by the observed climate change and forced by all the human drivers um, is really able to reproduce the observations. And then the model only has to be forced by uh, another um, stable state of the climate. So this is shown here in the orange line. And then the, the attributed or the, the impact of climate change is actually the difference between the orange and the blue line here. So it can, can be the trend, so the difference in the trend, but it could also be the difference in the, in the um, extent of individual extreme events or fluctuations in the system. So you could, for example, compare the, the damages in one specific year um, as indicated by the um, different C here. So um, between the orange and the blue line. And this is somehow the ideal setting uh, to, to address the question if you really want to follow the, the original definition. But often um, uh, the literature does something slightly different and here I just want to go through different approaches um, that that uh, we yeah we <laughs> somehow noticed when collecting the information for the IPCC report and the first one is um, the identification of weather sensitivity and here I just want to give two examples so the first one is uh, a quite prominent paper by Berk et al. that um, appeared in 2015, where they um, analyzed the effect of national temperature fluctuations on national, national GDP. And here um, the Y is, is the um, GDP and here I uh, in, in country I and year T. And then they, they um, fitted an empirical model where the, the um, change from in GDP from year to year 
um, is described in terms of uh, the national temperatures, the national uh, precipitation, and then uh, uh, fixed effects and uh, temporal trends that, is, uh, that are not related to uh, climate indicators. And they, they mainly focused on the estimation of these better one and better two, uh, describing the temperature, um, the temperature dependence of, of the GDP fluctuations. And this is what they found in the end. So um, better one and better two were really significantly different from zero. And they just, uh, the, the curve, um, you, here you can see this, the, this curve. So, um, and what it means basically is that, um, um, yeah, warmer countries uh, can still profit from additional warming um, with regard to the GDP development, while warmer countries um, on the, on the, on the right hand side of this plot um, would actually um, yeah, uh, see a loss due to additional warming. And this uh, non-linear relationship was a kind of, yeah, is a, a very consistent feature they identified in their paper. And there are a lot of additional studies uh, somehow supporting that there's, that there's a, a temperature dependence on national GDP. Um, another approach um, is on um, was trying to identify um, the individual effects of extreme events on national GDP, and again um, we consider the the change from in GDP national GDP. So I again is the country T is the year, um, the year to year change in in GDP and the relative change and try to describe it in terms of, um, of also uh, certain fixed effects. But um, then as an extreme event indicator, the number of people affected by the extreme events. So we considered uh, river flooding and tropical cyclone as extreme events. And the P is the number of people affected by these extremes. And uh, the question is whether, whether the signal of such an event is visible for a longer time in, in the G GDP time series. So we allowed for different lagged responses in the sum here. So um, assuming that the event still has an effect uh, uh, even after LMAX years, I think which was uh, 15 in our case. And we estimated the coefficients better. And uh, what we found is that uh, that there is a long term effect of these extreme events. So here you can see the, the uh, TC effects and the flood uh, effects and that they are still visible even after 15 years. So um, what you see, can see here is, is always the sum of these betters. So, so assuming that there is a, a unit forcing of um, in, in people affected by extreme events. And then the, the omega basically says, um, describes the deviation from the standard uh, growth path after L years. And so as long as this curve doesn't return to zero, it means that the effect is still visible. But, but these kind of studies are actually not impact attribution. It's actually the identification of weather sensitivity only, which is which we also defined in the IPCC report as the attribution of the response of a systems, system to fluctuations in weather and short-term changes in the climate-related systems, including individual extreme events. And the identification of weather sensitivity does not necessarily imply that there also is an impact of long term climate change on the considered systems, so it does not imply impact attribution. Um, but in some cases, it, it may do so. So, for example, if we have uh, considered, uh, there's another study by Clark et al. from, from last year, where they simply collected um, um, damages and um, uh, mortality reported for individual extreme events and looked uh, in the literature whether these individual extremes has been attributed to climate, uh, to anthropogenic climate forcing. So this working group one type of event attribution. And um, the, the basic rationale is, well, if, if there is, is um, if the underlying extreme event can be um, attributed to anthropogenic emissions, then the damage can also be attributed to anthropogenic emissions. And um, 
this is, I think, um, uh, based on the assumption that that there simply is a uh, uh, um, monotonous relationship between the strength of the, the climate event and the impact. And in many cases, you can really imagine that that is the case. So for example, if you consider um, extreme rainfall associated with, um, with a tropical cyclone, then it's, I think, quite, it's, it's um, yeah, the assumption that that there is more impact, more damage, more displacement if the precipitation is um, um, even higher, is is a quite okay assumption, I would say. And and then um, the fraction of attributable risk of the climate event, which is defined as the probability of an event of this intensity or higher under present day climate minus uh, the the probability of the event under um, so without um, anthropogenic climate forcing divided by p1 which is the probability under present day forcing the the this fraction of attributable risk of the climate event is actually the same as the fraction of attributable risk for the associated impact as long as you have this continuous uh, monotonous relation so it's simply that uh, the probability of the the impact is uh, being larger than the observed impact is then simply the same as uh, the um, probability that the ten, um, intensity is uh, of the underlying event is higher than the observed intensity. This is a quite general uh, feature if you have a monotonous relation between the impact and the intensity of the event. And so the P1 and the P, uh, P0 are actually the same as um, for, the, for the associated impact as for the uh, intensity of the climate event. And then you can also define the um, attributable risk in this way. So um, in this regard, I would say yes. Um, if if um, you can say well, the, this is the damage that is due to the extreme event, and the extreme event can somehow be attributed to cli to anthropogenic climate for forcing. Then also the damage can be attributed to um, anthropogenic climate forcing, at, at least with regard to the probability of its occurrence. Um, another type of studies um, 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 we, we collected for the IPCC synthesis is um, often done by climate impact simulations that are simply forced by simulated historical climate and by simulated pre-industrial climate. And then the, the attributed change in, in the or the, the, the change in the impact indicator that can be attributed to anthropogenic climate forcing is simply um, defined as the difference between these two simulations. And this is a, an example where this has been done um, by Izumi et al for crop yields. So here you really see the difference between um, maize yields, for example, um, and it's uh, the historical simulations minus the, the yields under pre-industrial climate. And uh, the issue here is that this, of course, helps for attribution. It's it's one one hint that there really is an impact of um, anthropogenic climate forcing on crop yields. But what what is it's somehow a kind of attribution within the modeling world, and it does not necessarily already mean that we attribute observed changes. So what would be great to add, uh, or which has to be what has to be demonstrated actually is that the models are really able to reproduce the observed changes in crop yields. And for example, yeah, um, it has to be evaluated whether the models are able to reproduce the observed responses to climate um, fluctuations of the crop yields. And only then you can really say, well, this is an attribution of observed changes because we can demonstrate that we can really explain what is observed by our model. And there's good reason to believe that then our counterfactual, uh, the difference between um, the no climate change baseline and uh, the simulated um, um, state, historical state of the system is is um, what is what has been caused by by climate change or anthropogenic emissions. 
And this is just a summary. So this is the synthesis figure from uh, chapter 16, um, where we really were quite careful in distinguishing between um, really impact attribution and uh, studies that just uh, did the identification of uh, vendor sensitivity. So what you can see here in orange um, is a synthesis of the real actual um, impact attribution. And in blue, um, we also assessed uh, the um, yeah, how confident we are that the system responds to weather, weather fluctuations. Um, so we um, we were quite careful um, with regard to the separation here, but um, as you see here, so there are many different systems we we analyzed. Uh, so each symbol here is, is a system. So for example, as um, um, range reduction in uh, terrestrial ecosystems, and then next to the symbol, you always see these small boxes, which indicate um, each box stand for one region, and uh, the color codes, uh, the um, coding indicates how confident we are that there's already um, a change in the system driven by climate change um, in this region. Um, yeah, in many cases, the confidence is still low, and there are even many empty boxes or white boxes where, where uh, there was not enough evidence to really provide an assessment. And it would, of course, be great to fill more of these boxes because they do not actually mean that there is no impact of climate change on the systems in these regions. It's more that there's no study showing this already, and maybe even no data to, uh, to demonstrate that. And as you see here, we only have the small triangles in these boxes saying that there is a positive on, or negative or an increase or decrease in the system um, due to climate change. But we, we could not really provide a more quantitative assessment of, of what climate change has done to the system. And of course, it would be great to have a more harmonized framework to maybe um, even provide a more quantitative assessment here. And that, that somehow um, um, yeah, motivated us to think about how we can maybe integrate um, impact attribution in the EasyMap framework to establish this, uh, the uh, framework where uh, cross-sectoral impact models uh, could participate in the, uh, in the task and add or help to fill the, the empty boxes and maybe become more quantitative with regard to the assessment of what climate change has already done in the systems. And if you are interested in the, so the figures in the report, but um, we also have the underlying literature for each of these small assessments um, collected and provided on, on the Easypedia website. So uh, for each of these boxes, you could look for the, for the papers we used to, uh, to come to the conclusion. And there's always a short um, a description of the rationale why, why, um, why the color is, is as it is here and, and um, yeah, how strong the impact actually is. And now Matthias will continue. So uh, welcome everyone also from my side. I, I directly jump on, on Katja's points on the last slide, which are actually a very good motivation for, for the second part of this talk. So uh, we saw in, in um, IPCC AR6 working group two report where we synthesized um, kind of the state of state of the art of impact attribution. There's many, there's many wild, wide areas still. So, so there's, there's not a lot of assessments in many areas of the world on impact attribution. Many studies are only, only um, qualitative, not quantitative. But on the other hand, we, we see there's, and, and Katja brought some examples, that there's many study, uh, many, many um, models and studies out there that, that address uh, weather sensitivity and, and um, we think that they have a lot of potential to to be with little tweaks be turned into impact attribution studies, um, and and I wanna I wanna show you now walk walk you through through some forcing data, and 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 also some examples um, um, to to show how, how we envision within EasyMap um, how we can actually broaden broaden the, the base of impact attribution studies. Um, Globally and 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 with 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 the knowledge that that is often already already available available in the impact community, 
Um, for, for people who are not familiar with it, a very short introduction to, to, to ESIMAP um, um, modeling world. So, so there's an A and the B phase. Um, we are looking, so for, for impact attribution, the A, A phase is relevant. So what, what we do here is we look at, at the historical, part, uh, historical period of, of um, climate impacts. And, and we, within ESIMAP, we um, produce, or like we, we curate, we can also say, um, climate forcing data for this historical period, period but also other uh, human forcings that drive, um, drive climate impacts. And, and they can be taken, they, they are freely available, available. They can be taken by, by impact modelers. They can run their historical impact simulations with this and then check and compare them, evaluate them against historical, uh, uh, historical observations. And that's, that's the model evaluation experiment. This is here, the upper, upper, upper row shown, shown here. And, and it's, it's, it's a classic basically in, in, in EasyMill. Um, and from there, actually the, the step to, to impact attribution is not so far. So as, as Katja explained before, what we need here, we need to kind of a model a counterfactual impact baseline where we, we put in um, a climate that would have been um, without climate change. So a counterfactual climate. Um, and, and we set up this kind of second now attribution experiment with counterfactual climate. And um, we worked the last years to, to, to come up with, with the forcing data set for this counterfactual climate. I, I, will, I will show, you, show you, you one one part of it. So, so this is an example part of this counterfactual climate data set, which is already published. Um, so what you see here, like upper panels is temperature, lower panels is precipitation. The black lines are the historical observations or like a historical forcing data set, climate forcing data set within ESIMIP. And, and the yellow lines are the counterfactual. So because, um, as Katia explained, we are, we are not so much um, concerned about the origin of climate change, but rather we want to want to attribute to um, climate change, no matter where it comes from, we can use, can, we, can, we can get along without climate models and, and can use a kind of a simplified approach to produce such counterfactual which is basically a fancy way of detrending the, the historical data sets that we already have available in EasyMIP. So you see this, this, this detrending de clearly in the yearly means in the both in the left panels. And the method is in a way a bit more fancy that, that it um, kind of smoothly adjusts the, the yearly mean cycle. So it kind of in the counterfactual, it, it keeps the, the yearly cycle constant. So, so in the, the factual, it, it would over time with climate change, it would would kind of distort, like um, and and this is kind of kept constant um, in 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 the counterfactual. You, you nicely see that in in, the, in in panel D for precipitation. So the the counterfactual yellow thick line um, nicely maps on the factual um, early period, which is the the black thick line. And, and this here is now one, one example for, for um, task and precipitation, for, for temperature and precipitation. Um, but we do that basically for, for all the relevant climate variables within, um, within the easement forcing data set, which range, range from temperature to, to relative humidity, um, with always like slightly different adjusted uh, statistical approaches that fit basically the the nature of the specific variables, and we provide counterfactuals for this whole set, so you, that you can that, that any any impact modeler that runs historical experiments can also run now counterfactual experiments. Um, so we amended this one one data set I presented now with um, several more. So so one one thing one one problem here is um, we we do not actually know how basically if this historical data set we have it's if it's basically the truth right um, and and to capture a bit of this uncertainty it's, it's good to have like several re reconstruction of historical climate change at hand and and at now we are we are close to having four different versions of this at hand so so the red line here show um, the red data set here shows what's already provided um, in, in um, EasyMIP 
and, and two, two additional new data sets are, are the gray and the blue lines. And I picked this specific example because it, it made problems. In, it, it's, it's a problematic area. So it's precipitation in Tibet. And you see the very high uh, precipitation in, in the very early period. And as the, the algorithm basically does not know if, if this is like just an artifact or if it's real data, um, it tries to kind of, in, in the counterfactual, it tries to, to mimic this uh, period of the early no climate change phase. And, and you see this increasing trend at the very end in the counterfactual with the hedged red line, which is basically wrong. So this is also a warning that, that before you use this data, you, you have to really check if this if this makes sense to you in the applications because some some regions are basically not very good to use because they have these these data artifacts um, so there was a short introduction now to the to the um, um, to the counterfactual forcing data within ESMIP. I will I will now jump to to the examples to examples of of um, studies that existed on, on exist already on, on on addressing the weather sensitivity of certain systems and Katya already nicely explained this example on, on um, temperature impact on, on economic growth um, so how can we how can we from weather sensitivity come to an impact attribution assessment and actually it's 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 very straightforward basically in this setup because what you would do um, you could just use the counterfactual forcing data and plug it in the model and the calibrated model you already have so this is basically the the counterfactual is i, I showed it here in in, in the um, in, in, in the yellow color so so you, you do a second experiment um, and then you have counterfactual outcome of of um, economic growth impact and you can compare it to the to the to your historical um, simulations and through the comparison you, you can make a statement on impact attribution um, and to show you that this is not something completely um, um, in, in uh, like out of the air and on the other hand it's also uh, sad to see that it's already taken so that there, there has been a study which basically did exactly that what I what I just explained with a slightly different definition of a, of a um, counterfactual that was by Diffenbauer et al. 2019, it was published in PNS. Um, so they constructed the counterfactual through using the, the historical record of, the, uh, of, of, of temperature observations, and they calculated from CMIP5 models a uh, trend um, that they subtracted from this, from, from this te uh, observed temperature to, to get their counterfactual. Um, and here, here, here's one result. So if you look at the upper panels, the dotted black line, it's, it's the historical growth rate on the left side for, for Norway, on the right side for India. Um, and, and the shading, the colored shading is the counterfactual. So for, for Norway, you see this is below the, actually below the, the black line. So which means in the counterfactual, the growth is lower, which also makes sense for Norway because one thinks that it got warmer there and, and this kind of, um, Kind of um, yeah, contributed to economic growth for India. For a hot country, actually, the counterfactual is above this this black line. So here, um, in the counterfactual, economic growth would be higher. That means um, actually climate change reduced economic growth in India. And that's a very that, that's that's also I, I show you this because similar graphs like this or similar behavior like this. I would expect with with impact attribution with, with the climate data I presented in the lower panel basically it's it's a, it's a time integral of, of of the of the shade of the color shade and, and of the upper panels so this is the, the effect accumulated of, over time on on, on GDP change um, so so such a study could di directly be repeated for example with with the different climate and factual counterfactual climate as I, I presented before that. Um, I, I also want to want to go back to the example Katya made with the attribution of simulated um, crop yield. So, so with the data at hand, can um, can now jump from from attribution of simulated so so comparison from from re uh, modeled recent uh, crop yields to pre-industrial crop, crop crop yields all in the modeled world. To trying to attribute actually observed 
um, historical yields with um, driven also with, with actually observed climate data and, and um, yeah, the, these plots were, were, were provided by Sabina Undorf, who's actually, maybe she's in the audience, hi, <laughs> um, who, who actually is working on this right now, and, and it also directly shows some, some challenges of, of, of this approach. Um, so in the black, upper, um, the, the black line in the upper panel shows the, for maize in the US, it shows the change of, of, of crop yields. Uh, of, of, of maize yields. Um, and you see this strongly increasing trend. You see in, in the, the red line in the up, upper panel, this is the factual simulation. And, and you see that it doesn't capture the trend. Uh, and, and this is like that because the, the well, the, the, there's not, we, we do not have all the, the non-climate forcing data at hand in a time evolving manner. So we could plug into our model to try to reproduce this trend. So this. We, because we don't have it, we need to use like time constant forcing data for, for many of these non-climate components. So it's not expected that we can, can reproduce this, this black curve here. Um, so this is a challenge and, and the, 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 uh, the modelers and the people who write the studies, they need to get more creative to ensure that basically the cause effect relationship from, from, from climate change to your impact is somehow captured right in your model. And one good indication is for, for crops um, is, is, for example, that at least the year-to-year -year variability is covered well, which you see here in the lower, lower panel. So, so the observed black line is, is kind of um, covered by, by, the, by the LPH JML model, which, which we look at here um, in, in the red line. And you also see that, for example, the year 2012 in the upper panel, it, it was an ex extreme, it was a crop failure year, so, so to say, with, with extremely low yields and you see that um, we have this in the observations in the factual but also in the counterfactual so as this counterfactual factual stays close to observation it, it doesn't use another climate realization what what you would do if you run the climate model but it's it's based on the same climate realization so you have the same event in the same year also there so you can can basically use use the data to also research specific events um, specific, specific sing, single events in, in, and, and do attribution studies on that. Um, so that was there was on the, the the climate data and applications of it. I, I now do a jump um, to sea level rise. Um, so another thing in ESM that we want to do, we want to have coastal impacts models. Um, and use them for the attribution um, of coastal impacts to long-term sea level rise. And there's so far, there's no forcing data for that available and we're working at the moment to do that. And what you would need for that phase of forcing data is uh, once, one thing it, it, it would need the, the long-term trends of sea level rise that we wanna attribute to. But it also needs the high frequency variation um, of, of, of the coastal water levels, because at, at the end, the extremes therein is what, what, that, what that cause most of, of the damages at the coasts. Um, so, so we, with, with our approach, uh, we, we came up to combine two of such data sets. So the Kodak data set, Kodak data set by Sana Maus et al. contains this high frequency variation. Um, the HR data set by Sunke Dangdorf et al. has these long-term trends. And we combine them. So, so they are here. The codec data set is the yellow line. The, the long-term evolution is the green line. We combine them to the HLT data set, which is the, which is the, it's the blue line. And this nicely covers, here's two example, covers um, or like follows historical observations of tight gauges, which are, is the black line. So we construct at first this, this basically factual data set for all the coastlines um, of the world. And then come up also with a counterfactual, which in, in this case is we, or like how we construct it, we, we, we fit um, quadratic trend uh, to, to, this data, to, the, to this data set and take out this trend to con construct the counterfactual, which is here now shown in, in the yellow uh, line. So this, this um, comes without the like long-term trend. 
Um, we are trying here, what we want to provide is a forcing data that said with the relative sea level rise, because the relative sea level rise is actually what people, if you feel at the coast. So if you sit at your beach house, uh, that is risk, whereas the risk for flooding, it's actually relative sea level rise, what, what you feel. So this is the most direct impact, uh, di no, sorry, not impact, but direct um, forcing data you could provide to, to, to impact models. Um, I, I'll show you um, two applications. So one, 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 one is already published on the very left side that kind of, um, yeah, um, motivated this work and, and also already used this work. So, so the, the left-hand side example of TC Sandy of a paper of Strauss et al, which got finally published in 21, is on the very left side. So, so you see, um, you, you see the New York area here. And they use a tuple of simulations. Um, so they, they run um, a flood model for this New York area with historical sea level rise. And they, then they run a second experiment with counterfactual sea level rise with 10 centimeter, centimeters less. And then I have different, different flood depth and areas in the New York area. And they can use damage functions to estimate from both of these simulations the damages and, and the map here basically shows the differences in these damages. And you can aggregate these differences. And from there, you can make a statement on, on how much sea level rise basically contributed to the damages of Hurricane um, Sandy in New York in 2012. A similar study is, is now being, being done by, by a PhD student of, of us here at PIC on, on tropical cyclone Idai that, that hit um, Mozambique in, in 2019. Uh, so again, here's factual and counterfactual. The upper panel is the factual, the lower the counterfactual. And you can see here a different of, fl of flood depth, but, but also of flood area. And you, you have now this, this, this um, from that you can, can combine that with different exposure indicators. So for example, with Exposed with exposed with with population, with uh, the assets in this area, or, or diverse other other such indicators. Um, Benedict, for, in this study, looked looked at the number of displaced number of displaced people, um, and, and he could identify that that we can trace back actually four point four percent of of the displacement that actually occurred here to. Um, to climate change, which I, I must say in this combination, it's not only sea level, but, but it's like a kind of a wind and a combined wind of, and, and sea level counterfactual. So these are studies that, that look at single um, events. What, what we, we, but, but what we provide and, and what we have in ESMIP, so, so we have, we have this con continuous data sets and we have um, several like impact models from, from many impact categories and all of them can run this factual counterfactual data set. So, so um, Katya, Katya already brought up this, this um, kind of list of, of, of um, extreme events and, and we envision that, that with the data we provide and then with, with the um, impact models that, that run this factual and counterfactual data, actually we can amend such, such an inventory, such a database with an additional column where we can actually uh, quantify the, the um, part of the damages that are actually induced by, by climate change. And um, not only that, but, but we can, can go from that and that, that's, that's my, my last example and then, then use basically indicators that, that, that we derive from, from, from both the factual and the counterfactual um, Simulation. So, so one one thing is, for, for example, exposed people to a certain extreme event. We have that for, for the historical simulations that that Katz represented, but we could it, it just replace it with with a counterfactual exposed people to the the extreme event, um, and then use that for a study that so far only access, uh, assesses the weather sensitivity to an extreme. In this case, um, the long term impacts. Um, on, on economic growth um, and come up with an attribution um, statement on, su such a, on, on, on such impact category. Um, 
Yeah, I think, um, yeah, we have, we have not so much time left. I, I think I can basically stop here. I just saying that, that we are, we have this, I, I now presented climate and sea level, but we're working also on, on additional data sets for like that additional counterfactual forcing data sets. And yeah, that's, that's my conclusion slide um, very quickly. So, so we see a big potential to, to use this kind of framework we presented because there's, there's many, many models out there that are in theory capable to, to run this experiment with the data we, we show, we've shown. Um, the data is free to download, have a look at our webpage for the protocol and for the data. And yeah, we are, we are very happy to, to also talk to interested people and, and to conceptualize new studies in this field. Um, yeah, let me, let me stop.